let me say, a word in defense of reason in dialogue with faith. Because faith is that proof. Faith unites us to that substance. But reason, in order to realize its full potential, needs the horizons revealed by and truths contained in the faith. And not just any faith, but the Catholic faith. Most, most people know me with this hat on, but I'm not supposed to wear it in a church, so I'll leave it here. Uh, thank you very much. Glad to be here. My daughter graduated from here. She, before your time, probably. Her name was Cindy Ray, and uh, she got her MRS degree here. <laughs> uh, she was, we had rented a house while she got her master's here. She got her master's in philosophy and theology. She's now a PhD in philosophy. And she, she teaches these huge classes on philosophy. Actually, there's just five kids, hers, and she's homeschooling them now. <laughs> and she married a guy named Ben Brown, who was going here, and he got his PhD in theology, and he's teaching at a university now. And um, I saw them studying together. They were just friends, but they didn't like each other at the time. And they were studying Latin, and we had rented a house for her and her friends to stay in while she went to for her master's. And so while she was... Um, studying with him back and forth, I, I said to my wife, I like that guy. I just seen him for the first time. So when they were done and he left, I said to my daughter, if he ever asks you out, say yes. <laughs> she said, Dad, I don't even like the guy. We just studied together. I don't like his beard. He's too tall. He's too loud. I don't like him. I said, if he ever asks you out, say yes, because I think you ought to marry that guy. And she said, oh, Dad, you're disgusting. Well, anyway... <laughs> A couple of weeks later, he came to her and said, Cindy, I have an admission to make. I like you a lot, and I've liked you a lot for a long time. She said, now you've ruined everything. She said, now I can't study with you. I don't want to like anybody here. I'm here to do my studies and I'm get, get my degree. But my dad said, I had to go out with you, so okay, once. <laughs> <laughs> so they went out together, and she, she called me and said, Dad, it, it wasn't that bad. I kind of enjoyed it. I said, if he asks you out again, go again. The next thing you know, he comes to my house and said, I'd like to marry your daughter. I said, good. I said, I, I, I've already chosen you for my daughter. <laughs> so they got married, and now they have five kids, and she's homeschooling them, and they're, they're just wonderful. I mean, I, I picked the right guy. <laughs> it's not a bad idea to listen to your parents. They usually have a good, good sense of things like that. And uh, I'm, I also have three other kids, and my son Jesse, and then two other daughters, and I have 11 grandchildren, because my kids are really Catholic. <laughs> so Cindy has five, my son has six, and when my son goes, he, he just bought a big van so he could carry all his kids, because he said we want at least four or five more. And when they go places, people say to them, are all of those kids yours? And then they give him a disgusting look. And my son says, yeah, they're all mine, and you better be glad I have this many kids because we're going to be the ones to pay your Social Security someday <laughs> when you don't have any kids. Well, I'm here actually tomorrow for a talk uh, about pilgrimages because we're going to lead the Franciscan Pilgrimages Group to the Holy Land. I've already led two of them. Uh, my wife and I have been to Israel over 100 times. I don't know how many over 100. It's, I lost track. But we... Uh, it's a, a wonderful place to go, and um, we've been there many times, and I love to live the Bible in the Holy Land, and I'll tell you one experience that I had. I had a group of people there, and we were down in the Jordan Valley where John the Baptist was. It was right on the uh, northern tip of the Dead Sea. It's the lowest place on the face of the earth. If Mount Everest is the highest place on the face of the earth, the Dead Sea is the lowest place, 1,250 feet below sea level. And I said to everybody, John the Baptist was right in this area, and this is where he met Jesus, and he baptized, and John the Baptist ate grasshoppers and wild honey. And I love to live the Bible in the Holy Land, so if any of you get a grasshopper, I'll eat it. I was just kidding. <laughs> but a bunch of guys went out on a hunt. <laughs> they skipped what we were talking about at the site, and I saw these four guys slip away, out into the desert, and they came back with this big four-inch wiggly grasshopper. And they handed him to me, and he, they said, what are you going to do now? 
my wife said, what are you going to do now? <laughs> I said, I'm going to eat this thing because I told everybody I would and I want to know what it was like to be John the Baptist. So everybody got their video cameras going and I chucked him in. He was wiggling and kicking and I, I chewed him up and swallowed him. It tastes like chicken. So anyway, this is, uh, I love to take groups of those. <laughs> <laughs> That's what everybody did. They screamed and they did, they, people walked away. But anyway, I, I won't do it again, but I had to do it once to try it. The talk I was going to give tonight was one that I gave first here on a, on a, a summer conference, and it's called Swimming Upstream. And I've adapted it a little bit because there's a lot of discussion today on the new evangelism. And I frankly uh, wondered how many people would come out on a night as cold as this to hear an old bald-headed guy talk about evangelism, but I think it's more than that, and it's about how do we live in this culture today, and I'm very, very impressed with the students at Steubenville, especially when I came in tonight and I saw a whole line of people coming in for confession. That doesn't happen even in a parish. There's more people lined up for confession here tonight than there is for a parish. Many parishes that have 5,000 members. If you go there on a Saturday afternoon, there's only one or two or three maybe. And that's very impressive to me, so I'm very impressed with the students that come here. And what started this was, I heard all about the new evangelization, and yet people say, what's the new evangelization? What in the world are you talking about? It's all these documents coming out of the Vatican. Who's got time to read all those things anyway? And then I realized that it was something very important because we're living in a culture that's becoming very pagan. My parents lived in a very different culture than we live in. My mom and dad, my dad just died four months ago. He was 93 years old. My mom is still alive. She's 91. And they were married 73 years. That's a long time to be married. Some people don't even live that long. And they were married that long. And many times they would say to me when, before my dad died, Steve, you know, the world today isn't like the world when I was young. I don't even recognize our country anymore. Never in the million years would we have ever thought that there would be such a thing as abortion that would be accepted. Not only accepted, but that the government would make it legal and then expect us to pay for it. She said, I can't even believe that people accept contraception and abortion and these things that in our day were not even things that you would discuss in polite public and thinking that two men would supposedly get married, although there's no such thing as two men getting married, because marriage is between a man and a woman, so two men can't get married, nor can two women, nor can a man with his dog. But the fact is, my parents said, there's an, how in the world did our world change so fast that here I am now sitting here hearing on the news that they're discussing making such things legal and even wanting us to pay for it and forcing it down our throats and these kind of things are happening. And my mom was the kind that when we were young, when we'd go to a movie, if they would swear in the movie or use the Lord's name in vain, my mom would get up and take our family right out of the movie. And here she is now 91 years old trying to negotiate what has happened to our country. It has become pagan. It lost its Christian, up, its origins and I don't mean that America was always Christian, that it carried Bibles around in that sense, but we were Christian in the sense that we had the same morality, we had the same ideas. In the old days, before Christianity came, when Jesus Christ was crucified and raised from the dead, he did it, it says in Galatians 4, 4, it was in the fullness of time this happened. It came in the fullness of time. It was a pagan culture, a Greco-Roman world. And in that world, it was called what we called polytheism. There were many gods. There were so many gods that they uh, had pantheon. And I've been to Rome over a hundred times too, taking pilgrimages and groups and studying and making movies there. And in the pantheon, they had all these. You could, have, you could worship Zeus or Aphrodite or Apollo. It didn't matter. They were all the same. Poly, many, theos. Many gods, polytheism. And then Jesus came and the Christians believed in him and they had a creed that said there was only one Lord, Jesus Christ, not many. There's only one Lord. But they had polytheism and they believed in everything. You could, it, it didn't matter what you believed. There was many philosophies. There were many philosophers. You could believe in anything you wanted. It didn't matter. It was okay. You could believe in Zeus. You could go to his shrine and worship Zeus. 
and make sacrifices to him. Or you could go to Aphrodite and make sacrifices to Aphrodite. It didn't matter. You could go to any of them because it was polytheism and it was okay. And then the Christians came along and very few of them but they began to follow a different Lord. And they refused to accept these other gods and these other lords. They refused to bow down and worship incense to them. They were going to be, serve only one God. Very parallel with what we have today. Because today what we have is pluralism. Pluralism is very much like polytheism. When you had many gods that you worshipped, it didn't matter whether you worship Aphrodite and you worship Zeus. We're all the same. You could have philosophy. You could follow many of the different philosophers. It didn't matter. It was okay. But you couldn't say there was just one God, that there was one Lord, because that was kind of contrary to the whole situation. Well, the early Christians, they turned the whole world upside down for Jesus Christ. And they weren't rich people or wealthy people. They were not well-known people or noble people. In fact, Paul says, Consider your call, brethren, that not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish of the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. Very few Christians. It began with only 12 following Jesus with some of their women. And then at the day of Pentecost, 120. And then when they preached, 3,000 were added that day. And then they preached more and further and another 1,000 here and another 1,000 there. And then Paul came along and the gospel spread. But it was still very small. They didn't have Twitter. They didn't have Facebook. They didn't have Catholic radio and television. They couldn't go to the uh, emperor's palace and protest his policies. They couldn't have open-air stadiums like Billy Graham has done so often. They couldn't have EWTN where they would preach the gospel all over. And now, thankfully, there's even Catholic street evangelism. I love it because some of my friends are doing this. There's about 20 or 30 cities now where they're doing street evangelism, a bunch of my friends, where Catholics are actually going out and preaching and teaching in the streets with people. But the Catholic Christians couldn't do that. And in the early centuries, you could, didn't even have churches. There was nothing like this in the early centuries. There was no Steubenville Franciscan University because it was against the law back then to be Christians. It was against the law to be, have this exclusive view that you said you only had one Lord and not many. But the early Christians, very carefully and very slowly over the first 300 years, were able to convert the whole world, turn it upside down for Jesus Christ. How in the world could they do that? Without being able to do door-to-door -door evangelism or open-air preaching or, or even, they didn't even have a Bible yet. Do you realize that? I used to be an evangelical Protestant. I used to be a Baptist. I used to go out and convert Catholics. I used to teach classes on how to convert Catholics to being real Bible Christians. And we believed in the Bible alone. It was all based on Scripture. And yet for the first 300 years, those 300 years when the whole, uh, these few Christians turned the whole world upside down for Jesus Christ, none of them even had a Bible in their hands yet and knew that there was 27 books in the, in the New Testament that they could carry around. Nobody would go to Mass except for Christians. They would exclude. It was Today anybody can come into a Mass. But back in those days, the Mass was very exclusive. Only baptized Christians could come in. In fact, for the second part of the liturgy, no unbaptized Christians were even allowed in. They would allow people in to hear the reading of the Gospels and the preaching, but before the Eucharist started, they had to leave. And nobody knew what was going on. In fact, the pagans used to say that we were cannibals. You know why? Because up here we ate bread of flesh and blood. And we were incestuous because brothers and sisters loved one another and kissed one another. And there was no gods up in the front, no Zeus or Aphrodite, so they were also atheists. And so the Roman world hated the Christians because they thought that they did all these evil things because they didn't know. Because they were world, didn't even see, didn't know what was going on in the churches. There was none of this going on. So how did the early Christians in a polytheistic, with all these different gods, how did they convert the whole world to the place where they would accept one God being Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father? How could they have done this? They didn't have the mass media to do it, and they didn't have power, they didn't have money. How did they do it? They did it because they lived a certain kind of life. And the fact is, is that they did convert the world, 
And in 313, Christianity became legalized, and shortly after that, it became the religion of the Roman Empire. And from that point on, Christianity spread throughout the whole of Europe and even all the way to India. I was just doing a whole tour of speaking through India in November all through the, to uh, help the Indian people learn how to defend their faith against Hindus and Muslims and Protestants over there. And the gospel spread and people became Christians all over the world. And for 1,700 years, we had a Christian culture in the West. All of you are here and your parents were here because of what the early Christians did. They laid the foundation, they laid the groundwork, they turned this whole Western world into a Christian culture. Universities were started because of Christianity. Hospitals, and I'll tell you even today, you go to Muslim countries, they don't have the hospitals and the universities we do. You give Muslims money, they don't build hospitals, university or schools, they build more mosques. And I know this because I spend a lot of my time in Muslim countries and I have a lot of friends there. It's the Christians who did these things. And Christianity took over the West. And for 1,700 years after Christianity took over the, uh, converted the world, for 1,700 years we've had a Christian culture. You and I are the products of that. We are still living off of that capital that was earned by those Christians for 1,700 years. But something began to happen about 100 years ago during my parents' lifetime, and they saw it, and they are distressed by it. The world is going back to paganism. We are slipping back away from Christianity. Christianity is now being frowned upon by much of the world. And if you want to know what America is going to be like in the next 10 or 15 years, go to Europe, go to France, and to Spain, and to England, and you'll see what's going to happen here because they're 10 or 15, 20 years ahead of us. And I spend a lot of time there as well, and I see what's happening there, and it's very scary. Why is it scary for me? It's not, I'll be dead before too much of it hits the fan. I'm already 58 years old, but I have 11 grandchildren, and I'm very concerned for them because of what kind of world are they going to live in once I'm long gone. It scares me the kind of world they're going to live in. So the paganism is coming back in. There's a lot of reasons why, and I don't have time to go into that. But things began to happen, and paganism began to take back over again, and now we're living in a society that wants to get rid of God, that wants to have homosexuality, contraceptives, abortion, and all, yeah, already euthanasia. It's happening in Europe. You want to go to the countries where it's a little bit ahead of ours? Go to Holland, where they're already saying that a child does not have any right to live before 12 years old. You have till 12 years old to decide if they're viable human life or not. And you can eliminate them if you want to. The world is changing very rapidly. How did those early Christians, in that pagan culture that they lived in, how did they actually change the world and bring it to Christianity? Because if we're going to talk about the new evangelization, that's what we have to say. How do we evangelize our world? We're living in a pagan world. Your children are going to live in a very pagan world, and your grandchildren are going to live in a very, very pagan world. Like Cardinal George said of Chicago, that he said, I will die in bed. My successor will die in prison, and his successor will die a martyr in the streets. And then that's where the quote usually ends, but I like the next thing he said that's not usually quoted. And his successor will again begin to rebuild society from the rubble, which Catholics have done for all time, always bringing back the culture after things collapse. So how do we evangelize our world? We don't have to come up with a new model, a new method, a new plan. All we have to do is say, the blueprint has already been made. The plan's already been effective. We already saw how it was done and it worked. Who did it? The Christians in the first century. They already accomplished it. All we have to do is go look at their blueprint and their plan and we'll see what they did and we begin to practice it ourselves. Unfortunately, it's a scary thing that they did. Most of them were martyrs. They converted people by talking. They couldn't go out and do street evangelism. They had to be careful about what they said. But they would talk to people about Jesus and the resurrection. Even today, you can't just go out and be crazy about the way you evangelize. You don't walk up to someone on the street and say, how are your kidneys today? What happens if you go up on the street corner or, or to the store down the road and say, how are your kidneys today? What are they going to say? My kidneys are none of your business. 
you pervert, get away from me. <laughs> my kidneys, what are you talking about, my kidneys? But what happens if that same person, you find out their wife is sick, you go and take food to the family, you help them out, you do things for them, take them Christmas presents, you make friends with them over a year, and then a year later, after you've built a relationship, you find out that he's got kidney problems, and you meet him at the same store a year later, and you say to him, how are your kidneys today? What's the different reaction you're going to get? He's going to say, oh, thank you for asking. Right? I'm going to the hospital next week, and they're going to do surgery and so on, and you say, I'll pray for you. The difference is you ask the exact same question, but what is the difference in the response? Is you built a relationship with someone. You earned the right to ask them about their kidneys. You don't just walk up to someone and say, you know, you're going to hell because you don't believe in Jesus Christ. You go up and you say to them, build a friendship, say hello, earn the right to talk to them. You know, many people, you're in school, college here, in university, but when you get back and you get into a job career, you're sitting next to someone in the office every day, you're working with people on the job every day, and you earn the right to share with them the things that are important to you. That's what the early Christians did. They began to share about Jesus Christ and the resurrection from the dead on a slow and quiet way, and they began to share it with people. And they also lived disciplined lives. The early Christians, Rome got to be chaotic. It was all about me. It was all about entertainment. That's why they built the Colosseums and the arenas, to entertain people, give them entertainment and bread, and they won't cause trouble. But the Christians lived very di di uh, disciplined and determined lives, and they stood out from the rest of them. They took care of the poor and the disadvantaged people. In fact, there was one quote that I found that was very interesting. It said that, I'll read it to you. This is what happened in the Roman Empire, what they did. They didn't have abortion like we do today. They had very crude forms of abortion and contraception. Most of the time it would be, do more damage than good to the woman too. So what they would do is just let the baby be born. And once it was born, they would expose it. Expose it means they would take it and throw it under the Tiber River, under the bridges. They would take it down and, and, and any night you would see people bringing babies down and throwing them under the bridge in Rome. There's a quote, when the Romans threw their unwanted newborn babies under the bridges, leaving infants to be carried away by wild dogs, because the dogs would collect at night and eat the babies. The Christians waited in the shadows, snatched the children, and took them home and raised them as their own. This testimony over a period of time won the hearts of many. This is very much like what Catholics do today. Catholics are the ones that go out and protest abortion, that help at abortion clinics, the ones that are saving babies, are protesting them, and help set up pro-life clinics. And I remember even my wife and I, when we had young kids, we, had, we went and rented a big house with three extra bedrooms so that we could bring girls in who were pregnant and who had been kicked out of their house so that we could help them raise their ba have their babies born and help take care of them. This is what Catholics do. Catholics are the ones who are earning respect of the world, but the world is going to hate us also for it because we're showing them up. The many of the world just want to have abortion be a right, no matter what it takes. They won't even talk about it. It's just a right. Don't discuss it with us. Just make it, pot, make it happen. They're not even reasonable about it. But when the world sees Catholics who are doing things like the early Christians did, going under the bridges and saving the babies and bringing them out from under the bridges, pulling them from the teeth of the wild dogs and taking them home and raising them, not only did the world see this, but the Catholic Church grew because of this. Look at all the new babies that were added to the faith. But this is what Catholics do, and this is what they did. There's a letter from the first century. It was written from Alexandria, from a husband writing back home. I am still in Alexandria, Egypt. As soon as we receive our wages, I will send them to you. In the meantime, if by good, good fortune you give birth, she was pregnant when he left, but in, you know, having a baby wasn't always as uh, certain as it is today. Many of the babies died before birth. In the meantime, if by good fortune you give birth, if it's a boy, let it live. If it's a girl, expose it. Throw it under the bridge. This is what the pagans did. And this is what the early Christians, how they responded to it. There were gods back then, even like the time in ancient Israel. When I take our groups to the Holy Land, which I take Franciscan in May 15th, we're going to be going, 
we're going to go to Caesarea Philippi, and there's a cave. And that cave is where Jesus said to Peter at this big rock, you are rocking on this rock, I'll build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against you. And that cave was called the gates of hell. This is so interesting when you read the Bible and you read it on location in the Holy Land that you see that the Bible is so much richer, it kind of pops into technicolor. He says that you are rock, and on this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. He said that right in front of a huge rock, and in that rock was a cave called the gates of hell, which is why he took them all the way up there to say that. And the pagans used to go and throw living sacrifices into that cave because there was water in the bottom, and there was no bottom. They would take a string with a rock and drop it down, down, down. They could never find the bottom of the water, so they called it the entrance to the netherworld, the place where the gods live underneath the land of the dead. And they would bring their infants and they would throw their infants into that water and then they would come back out at the other side to see if the water that flowed out from under that rock had blood in it. If there was no blood, it meant the gods had accepted their sacrifice. But if there was blood, it meant that the gods had rejected the sacrifice that they gave. It was the same during the time of Israel. There was gods called Chemosh and Malak and they would bring their infants. The god Moloch was a big pot-belly stove god. He had a, it was like a, made of cast iron. It was like a big stove. And there was a big hole in its belly where they'd build a fire. And then it had big eyes where the smoke would come belching out. And it had arms like this. And the arms were at an angle like, so that the baby could roll down into the belly. And they would build a fire in this cast iron god until it was red hot and steaming red hot. And then they would bring their babies and they would say, oh God, Malik, we are here today to ask for your favor. We ask for your blessings. We are bringing us you our best, and we ask you for your best. We pray for rains, for a good harvest, so that we may rich, be rich and plentiful, and that we may have prosperity. And then the father, to the sound of musics and flutes and drums playing, would lay his baby in the arms of Malik, and it would go like a steak hitting a grill. And then he'd push the baby and it'd roll down the arms into the belly and the music and the throbbing, pulsing drums and flutes would cover the screams of the baby as it died in the belly of Malik. And then the father would step back and say, Oh God, Malik, I've given you my best. I now pray that you will give us your best, a good harvest and make us wealthy this year. They'd give their firstborn son. Do you know in America we still have the god Moloch? People don't know it, but the god Moloch is in every city in America. But we have a new name for Moloch today. It's called abortion. Where Americans are willing to bring their babies, their firstborn, their thirdborn, whatever, and they bring it to the god abortion and say, take this away from us so that we can have prosperity, so that we don't have to pay for another baby. We don't have to have the inconvenience of another child. We don't want this baby. We want wealth and prosperity and freedom. Here's our child. How long can God tolerate a country that has the god Moloch still today? Not only is it just practiced in behind the scenes and in alleyways, Today it's practiced by the very government, a new president that's been elected, who's going to do everything he can in the next four years to push this agenda and make it more legal and more, more that we have to pay for it. Frankly, I refuse. I protest. Many died for their faith in the early Christian times. When Jesus said, you will be my witnesses, do you know what the Greek word for witnesses is? The Greek word is martus. What word do you think we get in English from the word martus? Martyr. Jesus said, you will be my martyrs, my witnesses. We think that it means that we witness for Jesus Christ simply with our mouth. Like we see an accident on the street, we go to the police and we give a witness, a testify. we testify to what we saw. But Jesus is saying that you will give witnesses, many of you with your mouth, with your testimony, with your words, but there are many others of you who will give testimony by being martus, a witness, with your very blood. The first 30 popes died as martyrs. They knew when they became popes that they were probably going to die. I've had the opportunity to speak to seminarians all over the world. I spoke to 800 of them in India. 
I spoke to a lot of them in the Philippines, in the United States as well. And I say to them, if you are cowards, get out now. And this is the same for sisters. This is the same for anyone that's going to commit their life to Jesus Christ in a special way. I said to these seminarians, I said, if you're cowards, get out now, run for your lives, because it's becoming less and less friendly around the world to be Catholics and Christians. And when that bishop puts the oil on your head and ordains you a priest, he is also going to paint a bullseye on your chest. This is what happened to the early Christians. We wouldn't have said that a hundred years ago in America. We wouldn't have said it a hundred years ago in France or Spain or Switzerland or anywhere else. But today it's becoming dangerous to walk around with a collar on today or to a sister wearing a habit. In some parts of the world it's dangerous to do that. And in America, unfortunately, it's becoming less and less friendly. I had a priest friend who just died recently. His name was Father Yaki. He was called the priest's uh, the physics, the priest's physician physics. And he said to me one time, he said, Steve, I'm an old man, I'm an old priest, but when I used to get off the boat in New York, people would rush up to me and kiss my hand and ask for a blessing. He says, when I get off the boat in New York now, people spit on me. It's not going to be a friendly place. I have great respect for priests who wear their collars and their habits today, and sisters as well, but there will come a time where it'll be dangerous to do so. To become a seminarian today is to wear, put a bullseye in your chest, just like it was for the early Christians. The Romans would come and they would get the priests and the, and the bishops and they would take them away and they would take them to the Colosseum or to the arenas and there they would die as an example to try and scare everyone else away. Tertullian said of the early Christians that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. You've probably heard that before. You know, even the word arena, do you know where it comes from? It's a Latin word for sand. In the arenas, they would have white sand because when they killed the Christians, the red blood would splatter on the white sand and make such a contrast that the crowds could see it up in the stands and they would cheer, kill more, kill more. And the Christians would go there and die. And Tertullian said to the Roman Empire in his writings, Every time you kill one of us and our blood splatters onto the white sand in your arenas, ten more will sprout up where that blood went, where that blood landed, because the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. St. Augustine said the church, the earth has been filled with the blood of the martyrs as with seed, and from the seed have sprung up the crops of the church. The martyrs have asserted Christ's cause more effectively when dead than when they were alive. They assert it today. They preach him today. The martyrs preach Christ today. Their tongues are silent, yet their deeds echo around the world. They were arrested, bound in prison, brought to trial, tortured, burned at the stake, stoned to death, run through with swords, fed to wild beasts. In all their kinds of death, they were jeered as worthless, but precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his godly ones. Justin Martyr was converted because of the death of Christians. And Justin Martyr had a profound impact on early Christianity and on the conversion of many others. He was a pagan philosopher. And one of the reasons that he became a Christian was because he watched Christians die. He heard that they were criminals, that they were cannibals, that they were incestuous, that they were ignoble, that they were terrible people, and yet he watched them die. And he said, how can criminals, these wicked, evil people, die with such nobility? How can they die with a smile on their face? How can they die singing and forgiving the people that killed them? How can they do this if they're such evil people and they're consistently across the board, they all die this way? Even with the most horrendous tortures, they still continue to praise God and to forgive their, their assassins. There were some, I, maybe you haven't heard of them, but there's the early 300, first 300 years, some of the tortures were unbelievable. There's a woman named Blandina who they brought a whole bunch of people. It was in Lyon, France. And they took them to the, to the big, uh, and I've been there before. I even actually went and found this. It was the, the theater there. And they took these people in there, 
They arrested the Christians in Lyon, and they took them there to die. And they especially tortured one woman named Blandina. And when they were torturing these people, a group of the Christians left, and they said, we'll deny Jesus, I'm not going to go through that, I'm out of here, and they would leave. And then a whole day of torture went on where they would strap them to pillars and they would burn them and they would strip the women and torture them and torture them all day long until it said the soldiers were exhausted. And then they threw them all in prison and said, we'll bring you out for another day of entertainment. And they brought them back out another day. And they started putting them in nets and let bulls push them around and wild animals go after them. And when these other people who had left, these Christians who had abandoned the faith, saw what their brothers and sisters in Christ were undergoing for the gospel and that they were saying, we are Christians, we will not deny our Lord, they came back, every single one of them, and said, we change our mind, we are Christians too. And they all died as well. And Blandina was the one that lasted the longest. And she was like a mother for all the others, encouraging them, don't give up. You are wrestling. You are in a, in a uh, it's like a sports arena. Do not cave in. Do not lose. Stay faithful to the Lord to the end. And in the end, they had an iron chair, and they built a fire under the iron chair, and they pushed Blandina into it when it was red hot, and she roasted to death. And then they fed her, let her pushed around by the bulls. This is what the early Christians suffered, and we don't know much about it, but we should because these are the ones who paid the price for us. We wouldn't be here today if it weren't for them. If the blood of the martyrs had not been shed in those first centuries, there would not have been the seed of the church that had grown up into what we know it today. They would have died out. They would have never conquered the Western world. We wouldn't even know about Christianity today. It was their price that they paid for us that enables us to be who we are today. And when we look at how are we going to face a pagan culture today, how are we going to confront a culture that's becoming pagan, we have to go back and look at them, and that's what I said. It's not a pretty picture of what our prospects might be. If you're a coward, leave now. I say this to my grandchildren. I say it to my sons and my daughters. I want you to raise my grandchildren to be martyrs. And my grandchildren say, Grandpa, why do you want us to die? <laughs> I say, I don't want you to die, but I want you to be in heaven with me, Maria Faustina and Damien Augustine. Because it, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and to lose his own soul? And if it comes to the point where you have to make a choice whether you're going to serve Jesus Christ and be faithful to his church or deny him for something else, whether it's a false god or for sex or pride or money or fame or your own life, I want you to know that it's better to die for Jesus Christ so that we can all be a happy family in heaven. Imagine that what the early Christians did. Imagine if tonight Roman soldiers came and blocked all these doors. And this is what happened to the early Christians. I'll just give you a scenario and let you kind of live through it and see what you think. You can decide how much of a Christian you really are. Imagine that the Roman soldiers come and they block all these doors and they step into their big Roman helmets with a brush on the top and they've got their swords drawn and they said, okay, no one's leaving this room until we all make sure your Roman's in good standing. We're going to set up an altar here and it's going to be to Apollo. Now let's make it Zeus. He's the king of all the gods. And we're going to have a fire here and there's going to be incense and all of you are going to have the opportunity to come forward and burn incense on the altar of Apollo or Zeus and you will declare your allegiance to the divine Caesar Augustus. The emperor was considered to be God. He came down from heaven. He was divine. And that was the glue that held the Roman Empire together. You could believe in any of the gods you wanted, but you had to agree that Caesar was the Lord, and you had to acknowledge him as the Lord and divinity. And the way you would do it is by coming forward and burning incense to the genius of the emperor. And when you did, you would be given a certificate of being a Roman in good standing, and you could leave tomorrow and go back and see your family, go back to your classes, and your parents could go back to work wherever they work. However, if you refuse to do this, there are other consequences. But we weren't going to talk about that right now. Pretend I'm the Roman centurion, and I'm up in the front, and I say, okay, we have the altar set. The coals are burning. All of you come forward, just kind of like you do in your church services. You know, when we have the ushers, and you all come row at a time, row at a time. All of you come up, and you will burn incense here, and we'll give you a certificate of good standing as a Roman citizen. Why aren't you getting up? 
you're all staying in your seats. I said to get up and come forward and burn incense. Oh, so you're some of those stubborn Christians. I'm going to make it easy for you. You could cross your fingers. Put them behind your back. I don't even have to see it. You don't have to believe it. Cross your fingers and you can still come up and burn incense. Oh, now maybe some of you will consider coming up and burning this. You'll say, well, I'm a student at Franciscan. I'm about ready to graduate. I can't waste all my parents' money and just lose my head like this. I've got to be... I'm a responsible person. I can't be irresponsible with my head. Oh, well, I'll tell you what. If you're not going to come up even with your fingers crossed, well, maybe some of you would. Sister back here might stop you and say, wait, 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 before you go up, let me tell you, wait, 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 Father back here will do the same. Before you go up and burn incense to there, remember what Jesus said. Have no other gods before me. If you deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father in heaven. And what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? So then all of you go back and sit down and take the sister's good advice. Well then, says the Roman centurion, I know how to deal with people like you. We're going to set up another altar over here, except it's not going to be an altar. It's going to be a chopping block. Brutus! The 300-pound executioner comes in with his 100-pound sword. <whistles> Draws it out of his sheath. And he comes over here. And they say, you now have a choice. You have five seconds to make up your mind whether you come up and burn incense to the Caesar or you come over here and get your head chopped off. Let me ask you, if that decision was pushed on you today like it was to the early Christians time and time again, what would you decide? Ask yourself what line you would get into right now. Would you walk out of here with your fingers crossed and deny the Lord? I'll go to confession next Saturday. Or would you come over here and lose your head and gain eternal life? We in America haven't been forced to make decisions like that. But people all over the world have. If you live in a Muslim country, you have to make those kind of decisions. If you live in China, you have to make those decisions. If you lived in Rome, you have to make those decisions. And it's coming to a city near you. Maybe not in the next 10 or 15 years. But I'll tell you what, if you look at the timeline of history and the way things are going, I am not very optimistic. There were 40 soldiers. They were called the 12th Legion, nicknamed armed with lightning. And they were in the 300s. And they were in Armenia. The Roman emperor sent them to fight in Armenia. And I'm just going to read this the way the story goes. When the great army was sent to fight in faraway Armenia, no soldiers were braver or more noble and loyal than this band of soldiers called the 12th Legion. And this is a true story. There's actually a chapel built to them in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Israel, in Jerusalem. But news reached Emperor Licinius that many of the Roman soldiers had accepted Christianity. A decree was dispatched. If there be any be among you soldiers who cling to the faith of the Christians, and that was a curse word, by the way, at the time, they must die. The prefect called the soldiers together and asked, Are any among you Christians? Hoping none would come forward. But 40 soldiers stepped forward and stood at attention. They were the best and the fiercest of the warriors. He was not expecting so many. He demanded that they deny Christ and offer sacrifices to the pagan gods. They refused. Not a single one would deny Jesus Christ. Finally, the prefect said, the decree of the emperor must be obeyed. I order you to strip and march out onto the ice to the center of the lake. In the meantime, fires were built along the shore with tubs of warm water to entice the, man to, the men to deny their faith and to go get in the warm tubs. Imagine tonight if you were stripped naked and sent out, into the, out onto a lake and they had a fire there with a warm tub and you could come back in and go on there. This is what happened to these guys. The 40 soldiers were stripped of their clothes, their swords were thrown aside, and they were marched out onto the lake of ice. They broke into a chant, 40 soldiers fighting for thee, O Christ, to win for thee the victory and the victor's crown. In the night, overcome by cold, one soldier caved in, crept back to the fire, and crawled into the warm tub. 
interestingly enough, the contrast between the cold and the heat. He died in the tub. From the darkness, the chant and the cold came out over the lake. Thirty-nine soldiers fighting for thee, O Christ, to win for thee the victory and the victor's crown. One of the guards watching the freezing men saw amazing light hovering above them. A supernatural light, he us, uh, figured it out, and it was overshadowing the Christians out on the ice. At once he announced, I too am a Christian, and he threw aside his clothes and cast a sword into the uh, snow, and he disappeared into the darkness to join the 39. Shivering beside the other 39 for Christ, he joined their cry, 40 soldiers for thee, O Christ, to win for thee the victory and the victor's crown. At daybreak, they were all dead. Their bodies were burned and their ashes were spread over the ice. So the question is, was that a waste of their life? Forty good men died. Many of them may have had families back home, obviously mothers and fathers, brothers and sisters, maybe some wives and children. Was it a waste of time? Was it a waste of their life? What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? Is there anything too much to give up for Jesus Christ in the end? The world doesn't want to hear that. The world wants you to bow to them and to their idols. But Jesus Christ, super, he overarches all of history and says, I'm the Lord of history. And these men, do you think today that they're glad that they did what they did? Not only do they save their own souls, but they save the soul of another, an eternal soul. That one man, the guard, who cast aside his armor and went out onto the lake, he now has eternal life. What is the soul worth? What is one human soul worth? My dad, when I was a little boy, took me fishing and he threw a stone into a pond and he said, Steve, watch the ripples. And I said, Dad, they go all the way to the shore. He said, yes. And what do you think happens if you throw a stone into the pond of eternity? There are no end to the ripples. They go on for all of eternity. One man, his soul was saved because of the other 39's commitment to Jesus Christ. Do you know who knows the value of a human soul? A human soul is so important. That's why we oppose abortion so much because it's a living human soul made in the image of God. It's not a piece of tissue. It is a human being made in the image of God with an in eternal, immortal soul that God has made in his own image and that will live from that point on through all of eternity. We don't understand the value of a human soul when we look at a person. Do you know who understands it more than we do? Satan himself, who will go to no ends to destroy one human soul. Because Satan hates God with everything within him, and he cannot hurt God. He cannot touch God. He would love to kill God, but he can't even touch him. It's not an equal fight between God and the devil. God is eternal, immortal, the only God. Satan is only a create, creation. There's, it's not like evil and good. Good and evil are equal enemies. God is God, and the devil is simply a finite creature, and he would love to kill God, but he cannot hurt God. How can Satan hurt God? Only one way by killing and hurting what God loves. You watch movies sometimes. A man will stand and say, I will die, you can't, I don't care what you do to me, I will not cave in. But as soon as they grab the man's wife or his children, he'll cave in because of them, because of his love for them. And God has the same problem, that he loves us so much, the devil can't hurt God, but he goes after God by destroying the human soul. So these 40 soldiers, do you think they regret what they did now? I don't think so. I think today that they're very happy that they did what they did now because now they have eternal life. And that's a true story. 
So how do we do evangelism today? In some ways, we have to do the same thing. We have to learn from them, look at their blueprint. We don't have to come up with new programs. We don't have to come up with new ideas and new, a whole new uh, philosophy of it. All we have to do is go back and see what they did. They cared for the poor. They cared for the babies that were being thrown away. They stood up for morality. That's what we as Catholics do. We may be despised, but don't forget there are many that look at us and they're impressed with what we do. They look at us and say, they have great nobility. They care for someone besides themselves. And it impresses them. How do we re-evangelize today? It's more difficult in some ways to re-evangelize today than it was in those days. It's more difficult for us because everybody thinks they know what Christianity is. Everybody thinks they know what the Catholic Church is and everybody has their own biases and their prejudices. And if you go out on the street and say to someone, I'm a Catholic, let me tell you about Jesus Christ and you should join my church, nine out of ten people are going to say, get away from me, I don't want to be a Catholic, I don't even like the Catholic Church. And tell your Pope to stay out of my bedroom, by the way. This is the reaction you're going to get from people. What happened when Paul went to the Athenians, for example? He went there to Athens, and we have mass up on the top of Mars Hill where, where Paul was preaching, and they said, this is something new. Tell us more about this Jesus and the resurrection. This is something new. And it says right in there in the, in the book of Acts that they were all that the, at the Athenians did was talked about new things. They were curious about new things. This Christianity, this resurrection from the dead was new. They wanted to hear about it. But it's not that way today. Nobody wants to hear about it today. You have to earn the right to talk to people, and some people will listen, but not a lot will. And so in some ways, it's more difficult to do evangelism today than it was back then. They'll just cover their ears and go, la, 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 don't talk to me about it. There's a lot of problems in the world today. And we as Catholics, I think we have the answers. I think we have the answers and we have proved it for the last 2,000 years. Through every kind of culture, through every kind of government, through every kind of dictatorship or democracy, we have survived and we have brought the answer and we have brought life to people. But not everyone wants to hear it. Real soon, I think, isn't it just a day or two, there's going to be the March for Life. I went to the March for Life in San Francisco once. Have any of you ever done that? in San Francisco? Do you remember those people walking on the right-hand side of you? I went around, I went along all the way telling all of them that they were, telling them what they really were. Everybody says, no, no, Mr. Ray, you're supposed to just pray. I said, no, somebody needs to tell those people that they're crazy. Somebody needs to tell them that they're wrong. So I did all the way along because they're on the other side. There's a barrier. And on the other side of that barrier, there are some of the strangest people you'd ever want to meet in your life. They don't represent normal America, but they represent what America is becoming and what America is celebrating on television and everything else with all of the homosexual and the deviant lifestyles and the perversions. They're all, these people are celebrating that and there's a, there's a wall, a barrier, and they're all going along taunting the Catholics and saying, keep your rosaries off our ovaries and all this and yelling and cursing and then they're half dressed and they're, we they're the weirdest people you've ever want to see in your life. One of them said to me, there's a good thing there's a wall between you and me. And I said, no, you're the one that's lucky there's a wall. <laughs> These people are praying, and I'm praying too, but I'm not as pious as some of them. But we're not, we're in for a, um, I think, in for a, a tough time in the future. So what do we do? How do we prepare ourselves to evangelize the world? Well, I'm preaching to the choir here. You're here at Steubenville. I saw the line at confession out here. They even had to shut it down because there wasn't enough time to go all the, to confession. Our parish, I go to Ann Arbor, Michigan. We have 23 men in our, uh, from our parish in the seminary, from one parish, 23 men. We have five confession lines a day. I think that the way we begin is by doing exactly what you're doing. Stay close to the Lord. Go to confession. Keep your life right. And make sure that Jesus Christ knows that you're number one in, his, in your life, that he's number one that you devote yourself to that. Find a spouse. Do whatever you're doing in your life. Focus on Jesus Christ and the Catholic Church and be loyal to that because without that, we're out without a rudder. And I also have a skull on my desk. And it's a real human skull. And my kids, they would bring their friends over and their friends would, you know, it's right by the front door. They'd come in and I'd be writing my books and things and there's a skull there. And they said to the, what, what your dad got that skull on the desk for? And my kids would say, oh, well, the skull talks to my dad. <laughs> and they said, what do you mean the skull talks to your dad? 
He said, go in and ask him. He'll tell you. So the kids, would, their, their friends would come in and say, Mr. Ray, yes, what does the skull say to you? <laughs> I said, it has hollow eyes and a hollow nose and there's nothing inside its skull. And every morning it says to me when I come down and start my work in the morning, Steve Ray, in 30 years you're going to look just like me. What kind of choices are you going to make today? You think you're invincible, don't you? You're young, you're healthy, you think you're going to live forever. You don't have to worry about what you do. You can make mistakes, you can live your life the way you want. But Steve Ray, in a very short time, it may be sooner than you think you're going to look just like me. And every morning, that skull scares the crap out of me. <laughs> I was going to use another word, but you can't use it in a church. That skull scares me because it reminds me of my mortality and that someday I'm going to be buried in the ground like they just took my father. My father was 93. He was a Baptist, but he loved the Lord of his whole heart. And every time I saw him, he says, Steve, I'm ready to go home and meet the Savior who shed his blood for my sins. And right when my dad was about ready to die, he was turning yellow. His kidneys had shut down and he was shriveling up. And he was my best friend besides my wife. And I pulled him up off his pillow and I hugged him and I said, Dad, in about a day or two, you're not going to be with us anymore. You're going to be dead. He said, have you confessed your sins? Are you right with God? Dad, do you still believe? And my dad just pointed his finger up and whispered in my ear, now more than ever. And those are the last words I heard from my father. And I want those to be the last words my kids hear from me. I want to devote my life to Jesus Christ and make him the first thing in my life and nothing else more important. I decided that when I was 17 years old, by the way. I remember my mom had Billy Graham on, tea, on the radio. We were a good Baptist family, but I was very rebellious, and I didn't want anything to do with it until I was 17, and I heard him on the radio one day, and that melodious voice talked about Jesus dying for my sins, and I had a soft spot in my heart for God. And then George Beverly Shea came out with his deep baritone voice, just as I am without one plea, but that your blood was shed for me. And here was a rebellious, stubborn, 17-year-old Baptist kid walked out in the street at night in the country, and I looked up and said, Jesus, I'm only 17, but I'm giving my life to you today. And I made up my mind that day I was going to live for Jesus Christ every day, and I haven't ever backed off of it. I haven't always done it as well as I could. But I've always made that my goal. And then when I was 39, my whole family, we became Catholic. And the, I tell the story in my book back there, Crossing the Tiber. I realized the Catholic Church was right. And it took a year of fighting and kicking and screaming before I finally came into the Catholic Church. And it was the best thing I ever did. But I realize now that I'm on this wonderful ship on the way to heaven. And with the way the world's getting today, the way things are changing, you're young. You've got a long life ahead of you, hopefully. Some of you don't. You take a statistics of this group, some of you don't have a long life ahead of you. Most of you do. You'll find a husband, a wife. You'll become a priest or a sister, whatever, and you'll have a long life to serve the Lord. But we have to be ready at any moment to go. And if we're not going to go right away, I mean, if we're one of those fortunate that gets to stay on, we may have tough times to face. If you become a doctor, you may have problems simply now because doctors are having the choices of whether they're going to be forced to do abortions or not. Some of them are becoming martyrs, not by being killed, but by losing a career that they spent a fortune and 12 years of their life to learn, and they can't do it anymore because they refuse to comply with the new laws that are being passed. There's going to come a day, like in Canada, where a priest is forbidden even from the pulpit to speak out against homosexuality because it's a hate crime and he can go to prison for speaking out against it or teaching what Jesus Christ taught in the scriptures. I hate to bring you this bad news, but the good news is, is that I've read the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, about the end of history, and in the end, we win. It's always nice to know the end of the story that we win. But this is what I wanted to share with you about our culture today. And I like to speak to young people because you're the next generation. We're handing us old bald-headed guys are handing the baton on to you. You're the ones that are going to carry the baton. You're the ones that are going to take the Catholic Church and the 
gospel of Jesus Christ into the next generation. You're going to have children, and they're going to carry it on to the next. And we want to see you, this young generation, with so full of energy and so much potential. We want to see you strong for Jesus Christ because for every generation we've passed on the baton to the next and the next and the next for 2,000 years and guess what? We're 2 billion strong today. We're stronger now than we've ever been. Christianity is the largest religion. But it's also the most persecuted. And I pray that God will give all of us, myself, my kids, my grandkids, and all of you the grace to stand for Jesus Christ in this church and to share the good news. We've got to share it. I tell this story, and I'll close with this. My dad, when he was probably 35 years old, thought he was dying, and he went out on the front porch of his house in Detroit, Michigan, and he looked up to heaven and said, if there's a God, reveal yourself to me. And the next day, a man walked up to him at Ford Motor Company and said, Charlie Ray, you need Jesus Christ in your life. Twelve hours later, after my dad prayed that prayer of desperation, for the first time he ever really prayed, Twelve hours later, a man came up and said, you need Jesus Christ in your life. Do you think it was a Catholic that said that to my dad? No? Anybody else? I see some head shaking. No, it wasn't a Catholic. Why not? Isn't it sad that it wasn't a Catholic? Why not a Catholic? Why do we assume that it was a Baptist? And it was a Baptist. It was a Baptist that came to my dad and said, you need Jesus Christ. Why do every time I speak to an audience, every single time they say, no, it wasn't a Catholic? Because Catholics have a tendency to say, well, it's private, it's personal, this is my faith, it's not something you talk about. I'm glad that Baptist thought it was something you talked about because it changed my mom and dad's life. And as a result of that, they had had 12 years of miscarriages. And when my dad became a Christian, they prayed for kids, and I was born a year later. And I was raised as a Christian. And I found the fullness of the faith in the Catholic Church when I was 39. But I'm glad it was a Baptist that came to my dad. But I want to see the day when it's a Catholic that goes around telling people, why do you think I wear this cross everywhere I go? I like yours, too. I don't wear this inside my shirt or keep it in my pocket. I wear it outside because I want people to know what I believe. I want to be a witness for Jesus Christ. I'll talk to anybody, anywhere, anytime about it. I wear this in Israel. I wear it in Muslim countries. I wear it in China. I've worn it all through India with Hindus everywhere else because I want people to know that I am a Christian and a Catholic. I had a guy stop me in the airport and he said, Oh, that's very pretty. Almost every day I have somebody say something about this cross. That's why I wear the San Damiano. I know you guys like it here too. <laughs> but it's very colorful. And they say, oh, that's beautiful. I said, thank you. I wear it proudly as a Catholic. I said it yesterday on the airplane. A guy said, that's beautiful. I said, well, thank you. I wear it proudly as a Catholic. And one guy said to me, oh, so you believe it? <laughs> and I said, enough to die for it. And he goes, well, I guess you do. And he, put, he sat down in the airplane, put his headphones on, and he was going to ignore me. But 15 minutes into the flight, he taps me on the shoulder, and he says, um, do you have a minute? Yes. I'm an atheist, and I would love to believe what you do. Could you tell, take a few minutes to tell me why, how I could be a Christian, why I should be a Christian? I didn't say a thing to him. I just wore this cross and let him know I believed it. I had a, this family was behind me at the airport a little while ago, and there was they had about three bratty kids, <laughs> screaming and pulling. And I saw they, I said, are, "Are you in a hurry? Why don't you take cuts in front of me?" I said, "You go ahead of me. I'm always in a hurry at the airport. I fly a lot." I said, "Why don't you go on ahead of me?" She goes, "Oh, thank you, thank you." I said, "I said to her, I said, if I don't believe it, I shouldn't wear it, right?" And she said, "God bless you, thank you." But I wear this because I want people to know I'm a Christian. I want to be a testimony for Jesus Christ. I don't want to hide it. I want it to be known to everybody. I have this vision, and this is why we'll really close with this. I have this vision at the end of time where I'm in the waiting room and it's the judgment day. And I hear from the throne room God's thunderous voice, Steve Ray! <laughs> and I come walking in and I look and there's God. Is your name in the book of life? Mm hmm <laughs> I will see. He goes through flipping the pages. Ray, Ray, S, Ray, S, Ray. Steve. Your name is here. Welcome into the joy of the Lord, thou good and faithful servant. <laughs> the door opens on this side, 
And these beautiful creatures come out and they start to escort me into the door. I hear music playing I never could imagine with human ears and smells and I just can't believe it. I'm being ushered into this door. But then I see Joe Smith called. Joe Smith? And I say to the angel, wait, 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 wait. I want to see, that's my neighbor. He's the guy that I went to school with. We sat next to each other. He dormed with me even. Or he's the guy that we had barbecues with on every 4th of July. He was my neighbor. Wait, wait, I want to see what happened to Joe Smith. Joe Smith? Yes? Let's see if your name's in the book of life. Joe, Joe, I'm, I don't find it here, Joe. I'm very sorry, your name is not in the book of life. And the door opens on this side and these evil creatures come out with hooks on their wings and they grab Joe and they start to drag him off to this where belching smoke and sounds of horror are coming out of this door. <laughs> and I say to the angels with me, I say, wait, 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 I want to see. And Joe, he turns and he pulls away from his evil angels and he looks over at me going in that door and he says, Steve Ray, why are you going in that door? And I said, Joe, it's because I believed in Jesus Christ. I was baptized. I recited the creed. I lived in the heart of the church. I loved God and I obeyed him to the best of my ability. Steve Ray, you knew about this and you never told me? You sat next to me every day at work. But Joe, I was trying to be ecumenically sensitive. <laughs> I, I was being politically correct. If, if I would have told you that you needed to be saved and you needed to be baptized, you would have said to mind your own business. Yeah, but you could have at least told me if you knew this was the truth. You could have told me about it. Even if I rejected it, I, you should have told me. But Joe, I wanted to stay your friend. I didn't want to be a know-it-all. I didn't want to step over the line. And the last thing Joe says to me as he's taken off into hell is, damn you, Steve Ray. This is a real scenario. It will happen. And I've pledged to the best of my ability, my wife and my family, that I don't want anybody to point the finger at me and say, damn you, Steve Ray, for not telling me about Jesus Christ. And I pledge my entire life, no matter where I am, to be a witness for Jesus Christ, to do the new evangelism, even if it means someday I have to die for it. I hope I don't. I don't like pain. I don't even like getting sick. I, I want, I've said to my wife, I wish I could just die when I had this. I'm not good at pain, but I know that if the time comes, I pray that God will give me the grace and the mercy to do it. But I've pledged my life to follow Jesus Christ no matter what, even if it means dying for him and raise my children to do the same. And I encourage all of you to, to prepare for the new evangelism, to love Jesus, to learn what you're learning here and to take what you're learning here out into the world. I love what I see when I go to parishes all over the world. There are DREs and priests everywhere. So where'd you go to school? Steubenville. I love that. It's a great place. Somebody loves you to send you here. God bless you all. It's nice being with you. Thank you.